to welcome you here this afternoon and to introduce my friend and colleague, Paul Ortiz, who I think many of you know, but it's still always nice to be, to be introduced. Um, we have a program here, of which this is the first this year, called Authors at UF, where we showcase the scholarship of UF faculty and other creative works of your faculty. And we're so pleased that here we are at the very beginning of the school year, bringing together faculty, students, librarians, and the campus community for a conversation led by Paul Ortiz about his book, An African American and Latinx History of the United States. Paul, uh, I had the opportunity to meet Paul when he actually interviewed for the job as the director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program. And since he arrived, the libraries have collaborated with him on, I don't even know how many things. Many projects. Many projects, <laughs> all of which have been wonderful and beneficial to, to both of us. Um, so the work of the Oral History Program is very close to uh, associated with us, and uh, we work with him on things related to Florida history, African American, Jewish, Latin American, and Caribbean studies, special collections, and digital scholarship, to name but a few. So I do have a number of the librarians who collaborate with Paul who are here today. So if you're here, would you please stand up? Shelley Arlen, Jim Cusick. I saw Shelley a few minutes ago. She kind of disappeared already. Flo Turcock. Whoa. Yay. Haven Holly, Rebecca Jefferson, Margarita Vargas Betancourt, Paul Loesch, John Nimmers, Lori Taylor. There may still be a few stragglers. I also want to thank you all for finding your way here. You may be aware, if you weren't before, that uh, people arrived Monday morning in Kreiser ready for the first day of school and discovered a pipe had broken over the weekend and their offices were flooded. And we very rapidly moved them into room 100 downstairs and equally rapidly moved Paul upstairs. <laughs> right. We were fortunate that we had this space and we were able to bring him up here for this event. So I appreciate your tracking us down and, and coming up here to join us. Dr. Ortiz is an associate professor in the Department of History. He teaches and writes about a range of historical topics that include both regional and national U.S. history, mm -hmm. diaspora, and documentary studies and the histories of social movements and labor. He's been instrumental in connecting with and making it possible to preserve the voices of African Americans in the history of the United States. During the decade that he has led the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, he and his team of historians have recorded and made available voices that might otherwise have been lost. And that's such an important part of American history, but also of the contribution that this university <coughs> makes to other scholars who want and need to hear and understand those voices. Dr. Ortiz has received a number of awards for his work, including the Harry T. and Harriet B. Moore Book Prize from the Florida Historical Society and the Florida Institute of Technology for his book, Emancipation Betrayed, The Hidden History of Black Organizing and White Violence in Florida from Reconstruction to the Bloody Election of 1920. He co-edited Remembering Jim Crow, African Americans Tell About Life in the Jim Crow South, which won the Lillian Smith Book Award and the Carrie McWilliams Book Award. And he's working on a forthcoming book with William Chafee, Behind the Veil, African Americans in the Age of Segregation, 1895 to 1965. His current work that he's going to share with us today, African American and Latinx History of the United States, helps us to better understand American history and the intersectionality in the history of the United States and of the Americas. Professor Ortiz looks at more than two centuries of history and finds abundant evidence of how the experiences and actions of African Americans, Latinx, and indigenous people shape this country. He uncovers the voices that others have not heard or may have chosen not to hear. These voices include Mexican labor organizers, African American civil rights activists, and Latin Americans who urged revolution to fight injustice. Each of these was a source of connection between the United States and the rest of the Americas. We find in his book that the United States is larger than one country. It's a multitude of voices and we're stronger for it. I'd like to welcome Dr. Paul Ortiz to the library for this year's first Authors at UF conversation, and thank you again for joining us. Paul? Thank you, Judy. thank you so much. Thank you, Judy, for that very kind introduction. And when Judy says that um, we at the Oral History Program 
are gathering, uh, preserving, collecting, promoting voices of people from all walks of life. Uh, as historians, we're just field workers. Uh, and without the work of librarians, those voices will really be lost because we have the capacity to go out and do the work, but it's the librarians. And whenever I get a chance to come back home and speak, and I'm really relieved that I'm here among so many great friends and colleagues, uh, we've, we've done so much work together over the years. Um, this is my, the 69th book event for this current book. Uh, it's been out since January. And so I've been to Washington, D.C., three different trips, three different trips to California. Uh, I've been to Northwestern, I've, uh, Berkeley, um, Duke, uh, all sorts of places. But it's such a relief and a joy to be able to come home and speak. And whenever I speak in this part of the world, I always want to kind of magnify uh, what Dean Judy said and really lift up our library staff and the Smathers Libraries. Because I first arrived on this campus not as a published author, but as an anonymous graduate student at Duke University. And Jim Cusick can tell you what I look like, a little more straggly back then, uh, maybe a little more hair, maybe a lower uh, hairline, perhaps, I don't know. Um, but Jim Cusick, uh, Bruce, Carl Van Ness, Joel Buchanan, uh, and so many other great librarians really took me under their wing and treated me as if I was a colleague and uh, spent hours and hours with me. And I can remember, Judy, when Joel and Bruce would be out in front taking a smoke break. Remember that? When people used to smoke? And it was so wonderful to be able to hear them tell stories about the University of Florida and to kind of be welcomed in. And so wherever I go, whether I'm talking at Northwestern or Berkeley or Duke, I tell them, you all have a really good library, but UF has the best by far. So I just want to acknowledge that. So what I'm going to do today is really not give a lecture, but give more of a book talk and kind of combine the talk with the reading. I want to do three things. One is I want to give you a sense of where this book comes out of, kind of the experiences, both personal and scholarly. Uh, number two, I want you to be able to listen to part of the book. Now, normally we do a reading, but we have um, amplification issues today, and so I thought I would give you a real treat, which is to play for you a few different excerpts of the book read by the award-winning reader J.D. Jackson. Now, Professor Jackson is a theater professor in Southern California, and if you've listened to books on tape, uh, Dr. King, Frederick Douglass, a lot of those great speech makers, you will recognize his voice almost off the bat. So I'll play a few excerpts instead of reading myself, um, and then I want to be able to open it up for a Q&A. Uh, and then I do have some books uh, for purchase. If you'd like to, to, to me to for, sign a copy, I can sell those to you for $20 each. The pens, by the way, up here are free. Uh, <laughs> Samuel Proctor, Oral History Program. I see my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Phil Williams, who's director of the Center for Latin American Studies. And as Dr. Williams can tell you, any place we go as directors, we got to promote, right? So free pens. <laughs> so I gave, uh, there are two handouts kind of floating around. And what I'm going to do is I'll have some uh, projections for you. I'm not going to read off the PowerPoint, but the first one is a handout, and we can share if there's not enough. It's just a chapter outline to give you a sense of the organization of this book. And to echo what Judy was saying, what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that the Global South in particular, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Africa, were as central to the development of U.S. history as Europe was. And maybe much more so if we think about things like democracy, ideas of freedom, ideas of resistance against oppression. Because just think about it, in the 19th and 20th century, when Europe is exporting ideas about imperialism, eugenics, colonialism, fascism, and Nazism, what parts of the world are actually developing ideas of resistance to those tyrannical and authoritarian forms of political philosophy? And what I try to do in the book is to talk about, especially the centrality of nations like Haiti, Mexico, Cuba, to U.S. history from the very beginning, not just since the 60s or since the 90s, but really from the very beginning of U.S. 
history and to change the way we think about U.S. history to think more along the lines of a north-south or south-to-north axis as opposed simply to the east-to-west thing, uh, which we often you know, are, are given or that I learned when I was in high school. And by the way, one of the, the, the joys of writing this book and publishing this book has been the fact that a lot of the events I've done, I, I try to, to kind of bundle my talks to where I make a big university pay my way you know, pay the flight, right? And then I'll give a talk at a community college uh, and a high school history teacher's workshop or just talk to high school students. And one of the things I've heard over and over and over again, and I think I'll conclude on this today, is the assistant superintendent of Montgomery County, Maryland School District told me, and she said, Paul, do you as a historian in this new book of yours have any characters that our students can relate to get excited about, see themselves as kind of modeling after, to see themselves as active agents in history. Because the curriculum that we have right now turns our students off. She said, she said, I'm not a historian, but whatever it is, when it comes time to history, and you ask people, give me an adjective for how you would describe your high school history experience, or a term of description. What's number one? Boring. Okay, I get this when I talk at a college of education, you know, from teachers. Okay, why does it have to be that way? It doesn't have to be that way. History, especially U.S. history, but all histories, should not be boring. U.S. history is tragic. It is triumphant. It's joyful, but it's also incredibly sorrowful. And when you talk about African American and Latinx histories intersecting you're talking about groups of people who intersect and overlap whose experiences over the past two and a half centuries don't occur in an upward arc. That is, things are not always getting better for people. You gain rights in one generation. When my grandparents came here, by the way, in 1914, uh, my grandparents fought in the Mexican Revolution. They had to leave overnight. They were really refugees. They win a sense of belonging, a, a very fragile, not citizenship, but, but, I mean, they're hardworking people. My great-grandfather, my grandfather worked as an oiler for the, the Southern Pacific Railroad in San Antonio, Texas, in the big roundhouse. A lot of men were killed. Uh, you, you had these enormous engines jacked up. You had 160 oil points, my grandfather used to say, and a lot of people didn't survive that experience. But in the early 1930s, just as it appeared as if our family was gaining some stability, some sense of belonging, the Great Depression happens. And Herbert Hoover, certain members of his cabinet, and I talk about this in the book, instead of talking about what did the U.S. do to bring on the Great Depression, picks a group of people to blame the Great Depression on, and guess who they picked? Like us. They said Mexicans caused the Depression. And so they started deporting us by the tens of thousands. Citizens, non-citizens, it didn't matter. And there's that famous movie where the young Jennifer Lopez, right, is, is actually being deported and they put her into a cattle car. And it's really visceral and very powerful. But that's what I mean by we, we win rights in one generation and then lose them. That is, our history is not progressive. It's not, it's not slowly things getting better over time. It's much more contingent. So I want to begin by just showing a couple um, slides for you. One, this is the personal part of the story for me. A big part of the book comes out of my classroom experience. So when I was finishing at Duke, I started teaching a course called African American and Latino Politics, Cultures, and Society, or something like that. And the reason I started teaching that course as a grad student was that I had already been teaching Latino history courses one semester, and then the next semester, I would teach an African American history course, you know, whatever the department wanted me to, to, to teach. Uh, many of us taught at NC State University, night school, night courses was a wonderful experience. And then one uh, day, a group of students fr uh, from Duke came up to me, and these were students mainly working in health outreach, advocacy, planning to go into legal aid services, uh, uh, labor organizing. They said, you know, it's great you teach us one course this semester, and then the other course next semester, could you combine them, please? Could you put them in the same space? 
because the communities that we're working in, in rural North Carolina or in Raleigh, Durham, they're black and Latino communities uh, in, in, in the same neighborhood and with overlapping histories, can you try to do something in the same class? And so that's really the origins of this book. It comes out of the classroom and now teaching that course for almost, well, actually really for 20 years. Um, and I teach that now at UF as my research seminar. And it's really led to a lot of interesting um, senior, senior papers. But the other aspect is personal. So I was born in 1964, and I grew up in the, in the 70s. And this is just a slide from San Leandro, California. And you'll notice this very interesting item. When I lived in San Leandro, California, and this is after my mom's first divorce, she remarried uh, a white gentleman. He moved us to a city whose nickname was Clan Leandro, like Ku Klux Klan Leandro. This is in the 70s. Mid-70s, they're having Ku Klux Klan rallies in downtown San Leandro. As the news item points out, and this is even after we moved, um, they're having cross burnings in San Leandro. The high school next door to my high school, San Lorenzo, the mascot when I was there was the Confederate Colonel. This is, you know, a 30 minute trip from, from San Francisco. So the histories of white supremacy, white nationalism, the U.S. Department or the U.S. Civil Rights Commission did a, a, a uh, report in San, San Leandro in the late 60s and a famous newspaper headline came out of it and it said San Leandro, San Leandro the most racist town in America, which I don't think is true, but it was very racist. And in other words, we grew up in the backlash era. And what I mean by this is a kid, as a Chicano kid growing up with very few black and Chicano classmates next to me, um, we were constantly targeted. I remember walking down the street, um, walking down Marina Boulevard to Garfield Elementary School in the fourth and fifth grade. And we'd be walking together and a carload of white adults would pull up beside us and throw beer cans at us and yell at us and say, you kids need to go home. And we would think as fourth graders, well, I'm going to school. Like, I can't go home, I get into trouble. We didn't realize they meant Mexico or Africa, you know? And the other thing they would say, which, which fascinated me, well, it didn't fascinate me at the time, it just puzzled me, was your people lost the war, get over it. And I heard that phrase over and over and over again. And I asked my mom, you know, what do these people mean by your people lost the war, get over it? Were they talking about the Vietnam War? Was it Korea? I mean, I knew about those. In later years, I realized they're talking about the Mexican-American War. So don't let anyone ever tell you that Americans don't care about history. We do. And when you think about President Donald J. Trump, he was the one that ran the historical campaign, Make America Great Again. He was the one who visited which president, almost his first official act as President of the United States, visits Andrew Jackson doesn't visit James Polk's grave, doesn't visit Teddy Roosevelt's grave, doesn't visit Ronald Reagan's grave, I'm sure he visited those later, but Andrew Jackson, the Indian killer, the genocidal president, the person who rises to power because he's the one who wipes out Native Americans in the Lower South, in Florida, in Alabama, and Georgia. So don't ever let anyone tell you that Americans don't care about history. This guy, is a, part of the reason he, he wins the presidency is because he uses history, but he's using racism and history as a trope. So I'm going to play um, a couple excerpts for you. The first two chapters, again, in Haiti, the centrality of the Haitian Revolution, the ways in which African Americans see the Haitian Revolution as incredibly inspirational, generative to all the early slave revolts, most of those in, US, in, in the United States, key on Haiti in, some, in one way or the other. Haiti is important not just in the context between North and South, but those of you familiar with Latin American history and the, the independent struggles know that Haiti becomes a beacon of liberty for oppressed people all the way through the, the, the period of Jose Marti, Antonio Maceo, Maximo Gomez, the list goes on and on of freedom fighters who find sanctuary in Haiti in one generation or the other. Uh, I'm the faculty advisor for the Venezuelan Student Association. 
I love sharing the, these stories with my students. Um, people ask me, Ortiz, I didn't know you're Venezuelan. I said, no, I'm not, but I'm also the faculty advisor for the Colombian Student Organization. Uh, and in the Colombian Student Organization, there's similar stories to share with them too about their connections to Haiti. When we get to the Mexican War of Independence, now remember the Haitian Revolution, roughly 1791 to 1804, results in the first free independent uh, republic in the Americas. So the Mexican War of Independence breaks out in 1810 and it rages from 1810 to 1821. And one of the first um, people have asked me, what's been your favorite research experience in writing this book? And I've had a lot of them. One of them was finding this crazy correspondence between John Adams, John Quincy Adams, Jefferson about Haiti, but then finding a folder of letters written by Jose Maria Morelos to Madison, to James Madison. So here you have a, a, a person who's becoming a leader of Mexican independence writing to a person who was a founding father and, and not just him, but other people as well. And so I put some of those letters in, in the book and what I wanna play for you right now is an overture that Jose Morelos made in the very middle of the Mexican War of Independence when it wasn't clear whether Mexico would actually achieve its independence or, or, or not, or lose. And Morelos is writing to the United States, and there are many other people doing this for Mexico because part of the assumption is that, you know, we're fighting a war down here very similar to your war that you fought against the British. Why wouldn't you kind of throw down with us? We're fighting for independence. You know, we're fighting against slavery. We're fighting for freedom. We're fighting against European uh, uh, domination. So why is it that you all aren't joining. And so that's where we, if I have this queued up here correctly, we will begin. Let me make sure I turn the speaker on. So you can see here, the, there's a moment of tragedy, a moment of possibility. The United States faces certain choices. Already by 1815, African Americans in the South are finding sanctuary, uh, finding freedom uh, in Mexico. In fact, even before the War of Independence ends in 1821, US, the US Congress is actually filing, trying to file lawsuits against the government of Mexico for lost property, which is really interesting because there is no government of Mexico yet. Um, but it points out the, the most important political dynamic of the early 19th century in the US is the fact that the US is, is an aggressive, imperial, expanding slave power at the moment when all the nations around it are either trending away from slavery, moving towards abolition, even the French Empire, the British Empire, Mexico, Haiti, most of the Native American nations. The US, though, stands opposed to those. And this is one of the reasons why the hemisphere is, is, is lit up in a series of really bloody uh, conflagrations. I wanna transition now to kind of make a bridge to reconstruction and then we're, I'm gonna play a couple more excerpts and then open for, for question and answer. But I also wanted to give you a couple of glimpses into how US history is really beginning to change at the grassroots and this is exciting to see. I'm going to Pasadena and I went earlier this uh, decade to do some teacher workshops and the kids there are learning about the incredibly rich history of Mexican American abolitionism in California we have access now to Spanish language newspapers published in the early mid 19th century, thanks to the work of librarians, of course, um, which are giving us glimpses into this really amazing world of Mexican abolitionism and Mexican American anti-slavery discourse and organizations in California and the Southwest. And Francisco Ramirez is one of the most well-known because he was an editor for a major newspaper, actually more than one, two or three uh, major newspapers. And I juxtaposed him here with Frederick Douglass. Most of us know who Frederick Douglass is, but it's important we begin to kind of get a more holistic viewpoint of the abolitionist movement, especially the fact it was an internationalist movement from the very beginning. That's how I present it in my book. Douglass, this, the wall of the mural, is in West Belfast on West Falls Road. It's at the Peace Line. This is one of the permanent murals in working class Belfast. And Douglas is a person who, who the, the Irish people have a tremendous pride 
and respect for. And you see around him, uh, they, the, the Douglas mural is permanent because of their, uh, their, their uh, love of Douglas. But then you'll see around, you didn't see here, up to the side is Barack Obama. Uh, there's a lot of um, Central American solidarity uh, icons here as well. Uh, Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth. But abolitionism was international because the critique about slavery and what we call racial capitalism as a, is that it's going to lead to civil war. And I won't read this quote, this entire quote, but this is a speech that Frederick Douglass gave at the end of year one of the U.S. Civil War. And he was asked by a very well-meaning group of Northerners, and I think this is in Philadelphia, come and speak to us about the, the righteousness of our cause and how we're fighting the good fight against slavery, against the Confederacy. And one of the things, if you know anything about Frederick Douglass, you know that when, if you invite Frederick Douglass to him to give a speech, you better be careful because he's not going to follow the script. And he does, this, he, he does just this here. Remember, how many of you have heard the great or, or read the great speech, what to the Negro means the uh, 4th of July, right? Uh, so he does the same thing here in a way. Instead of coming and giving a pep speech to a group of well-meaning Northerners, he says, you need to look at yourselves in the mirror and realize what it is you've done to bring on this ghastly war. And what he says here essentially is that, and it's a brilliant critique of imperialism. He said, you've done everything to promote the cause of slavery. You know, you've invaded Mexico, you've invaded Florida, you've trampled on the rights of Native Americans. Uh, you refused to recognize the governments of liberty and uh, of, of Liberia and Haiti. Um, and you did all these things. You even authorized people in the US to go to Central America to reimpose slavery. Come on now. So with all you've done to try to support slavery, how do your relations with the Southerners stand now? Not good enough, right? And so Douglas gives us this amazing critique uh, in connecting slavery to imperialism. So I want to play an excerpt now for you from Reconstruction. And this is one of my favorite chapters because, again, it's about the international aspects of Reconstruction. In fact, how this chapter begins and a lot of this book is really not so original, but it's really built upon um, the works of prior scholars. The opening sentence is, African Americans decided that emancipation in one country was not enough. What I'm going to take you now to, I can cue this up here, is a moment in time and in the middle of Reconstruction where African Americans organized what I call in the book the Cuban anti-slavery movement. This is the middle of the 10 years, what scholars call the 10 years war in Cuba of liberation between 1868 and roughly 1878. And Cubans are fighting this war. Um, the Spanish are really, um, actually usually have the upper hand. Um, African Americans, when the US Civil War ends, People like Douglas and, and Henry Highland Garnett and others say that we shouldn't be dismantling our anti-slavery organizations. There's an argument, a really uh, a kind of vitriolic argument in the anti-slavery movement about whether or not the anti U.S. anti-slavery society should be dissolved and all the others dissolved. Because from the perspective, from one perspective, you know, we've succeeded. You know, we've, we've fought the Civil War, it's ended. But Garnett, who we're gonna hear from in a minute, says, why would you even say that? Number one, we don't know if slavery has ended in the US. We have an amendment, we have some proclamations. We don't know if it's gonna stick. Number two, and most importantly, what about Cuba? What about Brazil? We don't even know if serfdom is, is, is ended quite yet in Russia. And so if we dismantle our anti-slavery organizations, we're betraying the cause of freedom. And so part of doing this book was very humbling, the research, because I would go back and research time periods and events I thought I knew pretty well, you know, as a Duke PhD, and realized how little I actually knew about them. 
And sometimes I went back to my original notes on things like reconstruction and found out that, oh yeah, there's you know, the, the citizens meeting in Silver City, Nevada in 1869. There's resol resolutions against the Ku Klux Klan. There's a resolution in support of voting. Um, and then there's also this major resolution about supporting the struggle of Cuban independence. And somehow when I was a grad student, I missed that part. Uh, somehow when I was a grad student, I missed the fact that in, in Southern Louisiana, African American political assemblies were highlighting the struggle of liberation in Cuba and putting it uh, alongside coterminously with the struggle against racial violence and anti-black violence in Southern Louisiana. Part of the point of writing this book is that we can complain all we want about nationalism, about white nationalism in particular, but as long as we continue teaching U.S. history as a nationalist narrative, that's what we're gonna get. We're gonna get people that think of the U.S. as a nationalist, standalone, exceptionalist society with no connections to other nations. So the moment we're gonna to go to now is the opening of the organization of the Cuban Anti-Slavery Organization in New York in 1872 at the Cooper Union. It's a moment both uh, dramatic and very poignant in U.S. history. And I will have to cue this a little bit for you. There's a lot of exciting information that comes out of this national movement. When I say national, um, African Americans in the end are able to gather somewhere between, I still haven't got the exact number of petition signatures, somewhere between 350,000 to 500,000 signatures on petitions supporting Cuban independence. Keep in mind, this is the era before Twitter, Facebook, you know, and so you had to spread these things. Um, from a social movement perspective, we could spend a, we, a whole semester talking about how this movement was knitted together. It goes from New York all the way to San Francisco, up to Seattle. I found meetings in Santa Cruz, California, of African Americans uh, meeting together to spread this petition, but they do it through churches, they do it through labor unions, they do it through fraternal organizations. Um, I wanna jump forward now to talk about the next period of, of history, and I'll actually play just two more excerpts then open it for Q&A. Um, the end of Reconstruction, W.E.B. Du Bois, a great scholar, calls this the greatest tragedy in the history of the modern world. Du Bois doesn't say it's the greatest tragedy in U.S. history, he says it's the greatest tragedy in the history of the modern world. The reason Du Bois says this, and in the writing of this book, it became clear to me that he was correct, and I, became, I, and I learned more about why he said that, was that if you think about the Cuban anti-slavery movement as a democratic insurgency, and you think of the potentiality of African-American ballots and African-American political organization, you realize why the Klan became so powerful, why disenfranchisement of black voting was a national project engaged in by federal officials, state officials, vigilantes, paramilitary organizations. The disenfranchisement of African Americans, Du Bois tells us, allows the U.S. to take that ultimate imperial move. That is, nationally, you've cut down, you've cut out the most um, uh, uh, consistently anti-imperial block of voters possible, and you've cut them out of the republic. You've disenfranchised them. You've taken their citizenship away from them. Du Bois says this allows the South to begin to run U.S. foreign policy and puts the U.S. more in the, the um, column of imperialism. And so in the early 20s, though, uh, when African Americans begin to reorganize to, to regain the right to vote, uh, citizenship, land, uh, labor. One of the interesting things is that they do so, again, through an international vision of citizenship. And the quote here by Du Bois, I'll play this for you in a moment, is when Du Bois is actually speaking at the National NAACP Convention in Los Angeles in 1928. And he's talking about why the Negro must fight to regain the ballot. And it's, it's for personal reasons, it's for national reasons, but it's also for international reasons. Because Du Bois' argument is as long as imperialism is thriving in the globe, 
we cannot be free in the United States and vice versa. And so what I'll do is I'll take us ahead to chapter five, and this is a chapter called Waging a War on the Government of American Banks. Yeah. So that's chapter five, and another, it's another place where the story gets really personal for me. Um, I'm gonna play uh, one more excerpt and then open it up for question and answers, but I wanted to just kind of highlight chapter five because it's really the early 20th century and a lot of African-American organizations, I mentioned the Universal Negro Improvement Association, which is, an, again, an international organization, right? But when I was in U.S. Special Forces in the early mid-80s, and I was in Central America, and I ran into Augusto Sandino everywhere I went, and he was on posters, he was on murals, people graffiti uh, slogans that he had made, and you have to remember, I'm a, like a 20-year-old sergeant in Special Forces, and I'm reading all these quotes, and I'm thinking, man, this guy is like the worst enemy we have. <laughs> and I really thought he was alive because his presence was so vibrant all over the region. And one day an old sergeant had to take me aside and say, hey, Sarge, you know, he's, he's dead. Uh, but what he said was very revealing, and I remember this. He said, we killed him, okay? And so I'm going to, to Central America, but my counterparts go to the Philippines. They might, we may have ended up in Africa. We may have been any part in the world to take part in multi-generational occupations. And so decades later, I'm in an archive reading black newspapers, and I come across Augusto Sandino again. But this time, he's presented in a very different light. These newspapers, the Norfolk Journal and Guide, the Pittsburgh Courier, the Western Outlook, are not radical newspapers. They're not Marxist newspapers. Uh, they're not, they don't even identify as left newspapers. But what they say over and over again is they lift up Augusto Sandino and people like him as heroes, as freedom fighters. And I found it very interesting, the, the Journal and Guide, by the way, a very conservative black newspaper, when it's talking about U.S. occupations in Haiti and the DR and other places, uh, says we should be ashamed of these so-called victories. These are not triumphs of freedom. These should be things we're ashamed of. Now imagine today a major newspaper says we should be ashamed of, of invading Afghanistan or Iraq and think about what it meant to be a black newspaper editor writing this in the 1920s. This is really powerful stuff, but I never imagined I would encounter Augusto Sandino in this context, you know, doing African-American history. So the last part, the last, we'll get up to, to nearly the present. Um, when I ask people what the largest general strike is in the history of the Americas, and I teach labor history here at UF also, I just taught the labor history seminar uh, last spring or fall, when you get in your mid-50s, events just run together. Was it spring or fall? I think it was the fall. But anyway, um, and I asked the same question. What was the biggest general strike? And my, the socialist students know right away to say the Haymarket. Uh, or they'll talk about Thibodeau in 1887. They'll talk about Seattle 1919, the general strike. And I say, try something closer to our own time. Try an event many of us probably even participated in. But again, we live in a society that, that dissuades us from thinking about the importance of collective action and organizing together. And a society which teaches us we should look to the elites, look to people in power, right? Today is a very important day. We go and we vote. It's a very important thing. My wife and I did, did advanced voting, right? But if, that's your, if that is the, the extent of your definition of democracy, it's really impoverished. It's what people in power would like you to have, right? You vote and then you, you leave the, the polling place and you let the people in charge run the thing, okay? That's, Stott and Lynn talks about that in class conflict in the U.S. Constitution. That was the vision of the original founding fathers at best. In fact, most of you, by the way, wouldn't have been voting at all, according to the founding fathers. But if you did, even if you did, your role was to vote and go back to the plow, okay? 
So this idea of collective action runs like a thread throughout the book because the people we're writing about in this, in this reinterpretation of U.S. history cannot depend upon elites or people in power to do things for them, and so they have to organize. So the largest general strike in the history of the Americas was organized on May Day, 2006. It was organized weeks and weeks and weeks in advance. People are writing dissertations about this right now, but I wanted to end with the chapter, not only is it the last chapter in the book, but to me, I'm often asked, well, is your book hopeful or is it depressing? As if you can, you have to have either one, right? You, why can't you have both? Why can't you have some hope and some, you know, right? Uh, and to me, the, uh, one of the hopeful parts is this long spirit of, of uh, what I call emancipatory internationalism, which you've been reading about. But another more recent that I witnessed, like I, I witnessed to see many of my students participate as organizers in the general strike in 2006, and then to think about what they've done since that time after organizing that. Because now, in fact, one of them I'll introduce you to, Jonathan Gomez, who was a rank and file organizer of the LA uh, mobilization in 2006. Uh, Jonathan's parents worked in the Bethlehem Steel Mill. He's a first generation college student. Uh, he just finished his PhD at UC Santa Barbara, uh, working with George Lipsitz. So now he's a junior professor teaching Chicano studies at San Jose State University. And I've seen a lot of the organizers from that May Day mobilization. Many of them went into work with the Obama campaign. A lot of them did. I argue in that chapter that to explain the election of Barack Obama, we've got to look to that moment of, of mass movement organizing to explain the emergence of Black Lives Matter, to explain the emergence of the Fight for 15 campaign. Because when you trace the genealogies of those organizers and all those movements, many of them go back to the mobilization of May 1st, 2006. So I'll show some slides, but I want to play some experiences from that chapter. So that's part of chapter eight. And again, it was really inspiring to be able to do, I mean, this is a chapter I could do oral histories, uh, interview people who have been part of that movement and again, follow a former students, um, Navy Dominguez, by the way, here, uh, pictured in, in forefront in this uh, photograph um, of movement building, uh, is a student who was a lead organizer of the 2006 May Day mobilizations in the Central Coast of California. Uh, back then, referred to as AB 540, which meant in the California context, an undocumented student. And to see, again, that generation of undocumented organizers, I mean, she went from doing this to uh, after President Obama was elected, going with primarily a group of undocumented women organizers and shutting down a Border Patrol checkpoint between the U.S.-Mexico border and San Diego, uh, actually getting beaten, standing up to that, and now is moving up. Uh, she's a lead union organizer for the Painters Union, uh, and has also uh, been recently appointed by the AFL-CIO to be a community organizer liaison between undocumented communities and labor unions. And so that's what I mean by that general strike, even though people see it as, as an event that's already happened, it's in the past, it continues to have a ripple effect. And it gives me a lot of hope for this new generation of, of organizers. So thank you for being very patient. I went in a little long. I apologize for that. I get excited about the material, uh, but I'll be happy to take any uh, questions or comments. Thank you. And any questions, I'll repeat them for, for the microphone so we have a record of it. Yes, sir. Paul, it's great to see you again. Thank you. I've been a supporter of the... Uh, 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 the Samuel Proctor Oral History Project for years now. Thank you. And your credit to the organization and to humanity generally. As you awaken many present to anti-imperialism, encouraging us to think critically about our culture's dominant corporate narrative, you foster a healthy questioning of our imperium's institutions. My question is, what correlates remain between uh, between your topic of abolitionism uh, and freedom uh, and, uh, and liberation theology, which was suppressed by a pope in Central America, I forget the year, but it was like, 
That's 72, 68. Remember liberation theology, many of you do. Yeah. There's a wonderful connection between that. And I remember coming back to the United States in 86. And remember, I had been in special forces. I had seen the conditions, the really hellish conditions that we, we had actually enabled and, and, and really festered and fostered in Central America. And the first thing that people would ask me when I came back home was, why are so many Hondurans in L.A.? You know, why are so many people from Colombia in Seattle? And I would say, you don't know? You really don't know, are you sure? And I would tell them what was happening there and they would say, oh, no, 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 Paul, uh, that's, not, that, that's not what you did. And I'd say, well, what did you think I was doing? Oh, you were fighting communism. You were helping the people of Honduras uh, uh, avoid a Castro-style revolution, which is what people would often say back then, right? And I would say, no, 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 that's not what we really were doing. But let me tell you why there's so many people. And so. One of the first things that I participated in once I began processing this information, I didn't do it right away, was to participate in the sanctuary movement. I'm sure many, actually I know of several of you here participate in that movement where we were literally providing sanctuary to refugees fleeing from Central America, fleeing U.S. sponsored civil wars. And many of the elders in that, in that organization, I didn't know it at the time because I, I wasn't a historian, but many of the, the Catholic and Protestant and lay leaders would talk about the history of abolitionism and the anti-slavery movement. And they would say, what we're doing now is in that tradition. That's something that we've kind of passed on. It's a great question. Um, and the more I think about it, the more I realize that, you know, a church can, can suppress or institution can suppress ideas, but it can't completely stamp it out. Thank you. Excellent question. All right, others. Yes, sir. Yes. Right. Excellent question. So the question is, Latinos are not one people. They're not one, one group. They're many peoples. They're many groups. So even within the diaspora I'm most familiar with, the Mexican-American diaspora, we're different generational cohorts, uh, different immigrant cohorts. Not all of us are immigrants. Some of us were here even before the U.S. was a nation. So the, the answer is that I try to explain in the introduction, this is a series of case studies of different historical moments. And I try to think about like change over time. How do these, the different groups overlap, but change over time? And so, uh, but the, the short, the, the long-winded answer though is it's not easy, it's very complicated. And what we need more of, and in fact, um, as you well know, uh, you are, or you're working in, in a lot of you know, the, the literary cultural aspects of Latino experiences and diasporic experiences. Um, what we have to do, I think, is begin to connect culture, politics, economics, and realize that, I mean, in my family alone, the generational differences and, and cleavages are really profound. But we have to start from the, pr from the perspective that there's not one unitary perspective. I think that's the most important thing to do. But that's also true in African-American history as well. And when I teach the African-American Latino history course, I often begin with that to say that we can't assume that the people, that the, the, the people come in one group and one size. We can't assume people have the, the same exact perspectives and beliefs. Uh, even in that movement of um, the chapter when I talk about the Cuban liberation movement in the 1860s, there were many different perspectives among people in the Cuban junta in New York. And some of the, some of the people in that Cuban, you know, group of Cuban emigres were calling for U.S. military intervention. Others were saying, you've got to be nuts. If we invite the, if we invite the U.S. in, it's going to be a catastrophe. But so beginning by the, the notion of, of really diversity of thought and experience and being, being really respectful, I think, too. I mean, I have an uncle in San Antonio who's an incredibly successful um, heating and air conditioning contractor. And, you know, he's, he's a second generation Mexican-American immigrant to the U.S. Don't start talking to him about immigration, man. He, 
You know, we, we go at it. In fact, one time my, my father and I had just been, uh, my father visited uh, uh, last year and we were getting uh, signatures signed for um, the fight for 15 ballot, you know, 15 minimum wage. And uh, so I said, Dad, let's call Uncle Leonard, you know, and tell him, you know, what we've been up to because we hadn't talked in a long time. We got him on the phone. He's like, I can't believe you guys. That's a bunch of communists, blah, 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 blah. So <laughs> not to be flippant, but, you know, we, we realize that we, are, we have so many differences. Uh, and, and, and diversity is the key, I guess. Yeah. Other questions or thoughts? Um, let's see if we have another Yes, hey. So, unlike a library in Peru, we do so much to get data out. Um, what can we do better to help um, histories like what you wrote be written? Well, and the question is what can we do to promote these types of histories where we talk about intersectional struggles and, and histories? We have more voices. And I think about Ephraim's question and your question, Haven. And, Part of it is, and this is going to sound like a history professor answer, it is, um, we just need more curriculum and courses. And because in the libraries you've given, I mean, we have the material all around us like right now. I'm looking at these books as I walk up and down and just like I'm in awe and I'm thinking, how can we turn this into curriculum? The, the tools are there. We don't have an African American studies department, strike one. We don't have a Latinx studies department, strike two. We don't have an Asian American studies department. Okay, so I'm not gonna say strike three because it's too predictable, <laughs> right? I, I don't know how we started, the, I, I apologize for the bad sports metaphor, right? Um, but we need these things so desperately, I can't even tell you. I mean, when I go to California, when I go to New York, when I go to Illinois, my gosh, when I go to Texas, let me tell you about my former student, Max Crockmall, uh, who finished his PhD at Duke a few years ago, has founded a comparative ethnic studies program at Texas Christian University. And I'm going and he's having me give a keynote to open up his events. And I'm like, man, we should be having you come to here to give a keynote. I mean, so it's happening all over the country and that's what we need is, is, is curriculum. That's just one answer, but I'm gonna give you my, my history profs hat's answer is that our students are so hungry for this kind of knowledge. And when we offer these courses, they take the courses, but we need to be, um, we need to catch up quite a bit. But here's the advantage. We don't have these departments yet, and so, but, but many of us have been around the block and we're in contact with colleagues in other, other departments across the country. We can, have, we can learn from the mistakes that they made as we build these, this new curriculum. Uh, we have this new Quest curriculum on the horizon, right? We can use that new curriculum to interject Things like experiential learning, getting our students in direct contact with people in the Coalition of Immokalee Workers. That's a big part of that chapter is the role that farm workers play in new organizing. Um, getting students reading Puerto Rican, Mexican, uh, uh, Haitian literature. I mean, we have, I think next year, the Haitian uh, Studies Conference is gonna be here. Is that, is that correct, uh, Dr. Will? And so that's a tremendous opportunity uh, for us. But we, we have to begin doing more of these, these things. Uh, we've got, in other words, institutionalize it. And then the, 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 the piece to connect to that, I think, is, and I learned a lot, you know, looking at Antonio, uh, my, my friend and colleague, um, he can tell you very well about Carlos Munoz and the work that scholars did at UC Berkeley in that first generation of, of ethnic studies learning. And the important lesson is you've got to keep the connection to the broader community, the broader world. It's gotta be reciprocal. It can't just be a bunch of classes at the University of Florida, and then we're, we're cut off somehow from Gainesville or from Live Oak or, or Cedar Key or what have you. We have to keep those connections between community and campus going. I mean, that was the tremendous achievement of that generation of scholars that founded those incredible programs, like people like, again, Carlos Munoz, uh, Angela Davis, uh, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, who, uh, by the way, wrote an indigenous people's history of the United States, which is the preceding volume in the series that this book came out in. And, and again, the connections between community, campus, civic engagement are critical. Sorry, I got I worked up again. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. So how do we strengthen 
Well, it's a, good, it's a good question. I think one of the things we're doing now in the Department of History is saying, um, history shouldn't just be, and again, I'm just talking about one department, but we had a great department meeting earlier in the year, um, well, first department meeting, and we came up with the, the, the idea that, why aren't we talking to high school history teachers? Why aren't we more active in our local community? And like, for example, I've done teachers workshops in Maryland and Washington State and California, well, what about here? Uh, and, but then realizing that the knowledge is reciprocal. And what I mean by this is avoiding the tendency that we have, not just at UF, but every university, to think that we're the only ones that have things to teach for other people in, in like Gainesville to learn. The reality is, and we know this from the oral history world, uh, Kyle can tell you, uh, and, and other students, Juliet who's, who, and, and Elaine, who've worked in oral history in this area, one of the great things about oral history is that we go not to, to necessarily study people, but to learn from them. That's our MO. That's what we do really well. And the, the distinction is very important. There's knowledge in this community, everywhere in this community that we need to really kind of take to heart. And a problem that universities have is often they assume that, you know, we have all these great things to teach and share with the rest of the world. And that is true, we do but we have to keep our ears open because they have given us just as much in this campus. And I remember a few years ago, I was on the, um, you know, the UF goals task force and we would go around the table and some of our colleagues would say things like, well, you know, uh, if it wasn't for the University of Florida, uh, Gainesville would be like Lake City. And some of us would say, well, what's wrong with that? I mean, Lake City is a really cool town, you know? And maybe we should be thinking about more things that we can do for the community instead of just thinking that everything we do is a great thing. Like, do we pay for water? Do we pay for fire services? Do we pay for, pay for policing? And maybe we, maybe we can't pay for those things, but maybe we can do some things to kind of make up for that because I, we take as much out of this community as, as we give. And we have to remember that. If, as long as we remember that, we can be good citizens. But when we forget that and believe that everything we do is somehow value added for the surrounding community, then I think we really go awry. Um, other, yes. The Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement? Yeah. Okay, very good. So, in, I'm so glad you asked about DRUM. Dodge Revolutionary Union Movement was part of a constellation of great black left union movements in the 60s. And in chapter six, I talk about that milieu of radical black organizations. And I think part of the strength was their connectivity to working conditions, the question of automation, because after all, this is the 55th anniversary of what event? No. March on Washington, right? So in the March on Washington in 63, which precedes the formation of, of DRUM and L. Rum and those other organizations, A. Philip Randolph says what? The greatest threat we're facing now is what? Automation. He says civil rights is great, voting is great, but if we don't have a solid economic basis, then we don't have anything. And automation is already happening. It's, it's costing us our jobs. And DRUM has this beautiful connection between shop floor politics and, and trying to say, let's create a humanistic work environment, again, with an anti-colonial mindset. Let's think about the connections between the Dodge Main plan in Detroit or in my chapter, I connect uh, them to the United Construction Workers, which was a black Marxist organization in Seattle trying to get construction jobs open to African-American workers. And when they had finished that campaign, guess where they went next? South Africa to work on the anti-apartheid movement. So yeah, there's a great connections between those. And, and we need more work on that, on those organizations. Thank you. All right, no more questions. Lou, we'll get back to you. Um, 
Sinclair Lewis said, it's hard to convince people of something when their jobs depend upon not believing it. And in terms of fitting in to the imperium that we're in and going along and getting along, and uh, it seems to me that it's, uh, it's it, on the surface, you know, it's all political correctness, and right? And a great definition of political correctness is just being polite and decent, right? Well, um, there's a saying, I said to Pat Conroy, and he, he had never heard this before, but, and all generalizations are false, including this one, Mark Twain said that. The northern white man didn't care how high uh, the black man got, just so he didn't get too close. The southern white man didn't care how close the black man got, just so he didn't get too high. And so the issue of class comes into, I think, every discussion that you try to have sure. regarding change and cultural conditions. The issue of class is really critical. It's really woven throughout the book. I mean, the issue of what kind of economic system do we want going forward? Because currently the economic system that we have is a system which continues to generate divisions. Um, I'm teaching a graduate race and ethnicity seminar right now. Uh, capital creates identities. It creates divisions between people. We had a 1791 Naturalization Act which said that you had to be white to become a naturalized citizen. That held force pretty much up into the civil rights movement. And so the question is what kind of economic system do we want to have? Do we want to have, continue to have a system which is based upon these divisions or do we want to create something different and new and something maybe more sustainable because that's a major aspect. And again, I'll just, I'll conclude on that point by saying that the students in these photographs from that mobilization are already thinking about the next step. They're not taking the world for granted. My generation did. Like I assumed as a young labor organizer, the economic system we had was going to be with us forever. But I can tell you that this new generation doesn't start from that assumption. Uh, and part of it is they use their marginality as a strength. And so they begin, as I mentioned the term AB 540, undocumented people, but again, now they're becoming you know, leaders uh, in their neighborhoods, in university institutions, and in law firms, and labor unions. And there's changes are coming. Uh, and they're, they're really exciting too. So, um, but again, thank you so much for being patient. I've kept you here a long time. Um, I do have uh, uh, books to sell if you'd like to buy one. Um, I, and free pens, please take a free pen. Uh, and thank you.